Good morning. You're invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you also. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Let us pray. O oh God, we eagerly await your coming into our lives and our world. Prepare us to see the many signs of your presence. Reinforce our confidence to let our lights shine brightly in the dark places of life as an encouragement for those who struggle and doubt. We offer our prayer in Jesus' name.
We welcome you to worship today at First United Methodist Church. We're especially invited, uh, excited, invited, excited. We are especially excited about those of you who are here as guests or visitors, particularly any of you that may be new to our community. Please let us know ways that we can help you learn information about our church and help you find a place in the church. One of our traditions at the end of the service is to invite you to come forward if you'd like to become a member of the church. There is a Today card that you can fill out and bring that with you as we sing our closing hymn. If you would simply like to explore the possibility of becoming a member of the church, there's a note in the bulletin that indicates that Lamar Smith from our church staff would be honored if you would call him or email him. You like contact with people, don't you, Lamar? Oh, yeah. Yes, he does. <laughs> so truly, if you'd like to visit with Lamar Smith or any of us on the staff about this church, please don't hesitate to do that. Thank you to everyone who's brought a bear today for Bear Sunday for our mission. And please know that if you weren't able to do it today, you may certainly do it in the days or the weeks ahead. All those bears will be given to children and to families through our mission. Ann Maddox is over waving her hand right now. Ann is our docent who's giving a tour today of the church. If, you'd, if you've never had a tour of the church, today would be a perfect time to do that. Ann will meet folks over here by the piano after this worship service. And it's a chance to learn about this space and other spaces in the building. And thank you so much for, for doing that today. This is just a little snapshot of what's coming ahead. Uh, if this uh, is something that you're a part of, you should listen closely. If not, just take in the volume of all the things. Here we go. Tonight, lessons and carols in our, chap in our chapel with the Adoramus Vocal Ensemble will be beautiful. Tuesday, United Methodist Women's Luncheon, Ann Pop is leading a program on that. That will be excellent. The Lamplighter Christmas Party is on Wednesday evening. Another great opportunity. Please call the church if you'd like to come and be a part of that. Fifth Street Coffee House on Friday night. Great musicians who will be leading that. A very unique spiritual life retreat during the day on Saturday, and I hope you'll look at the information in the bulletin about that. And then next Sunday, our choral union and our youth choir will combine for a concert here in the sanctuary on Sunday evening. Also next Sunday, something that did not appear in the bulletin but is very important, we periodically have blood drives here at the church. One of those blood drives will be next Sunday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., and there'll be information in the bulletin next week about what room that will take place in. Perhaps you've noticed already that there are some green cards, hopefully near where you are. They are cards that give you Christmas volunteering opportunities. It talks about the live nativity scene. If you would like to be part of the live nativity scene, you may mark that box or contact Perry Cockrell. There's information in the bulletin. If you'd like to help serve the Christmas chili lunches to the homeless, it gives the dates and you may mark that. And also, if you'd like to be part of the distribution for all the Giving Tree gifts that our church is in the process of collecting, it gives the time on Saturday the 18th. If any of these are things that you'd like to be a part of, please do just fill it out quickly. And if you would bring it to the Welcome Center today, we'll make certain that you are included in those things. Speaking of the Giving Tree, there isn't an announcement in the bulletin today, but there is late breaking news, and that is that because all of you snatched up the doll so quickly and so generously, our church has made arrangements to have a f 140 new dolls, and they are significant because these dolls represent children that often fall through the cracks. They are part of families that are in transitional housing not necessarily homeless children, but in transitional housing and often they don't qualify for other programs. 
So if you haven't had a chance to get a doll from the Welcome Center for the opportunity to purchase gifts, today is a chance for you to do that, and we thank you for that. So many are so very generous. We hope that you've noticed that the Advent devotional booklets are available all over the church. Members of our church and our staff have written devotions for each day during Advent. And speaking of Advent, we continue our tradition of lighting candles on the Advent wreath. And so today we are honored to welcome Lori and Forrest Pugh and their two-year-old son, Landry. I can only imagine what all this looks like to Landry and what he's taking in. But Landry, with his mom and his dad, are coming to light our two candles today. The first candle is a symbol of Christ our hope. The second candle is a symbol of Christ the way. May the word sent from God through the prophets lead us to the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Our first lesson is found in Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, a reading from Isaiah. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch <laughs> shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his eyes hear, his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. A little child is leading us. Excuse me. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. In my study this week, I have learned that when Calvin ruled Geneva, a man smiled during a baptism and was put in jail for three days. You may smile today during this baptism and you'll be free. Let us open our hearts and our spirits as the Van Meter family brings their son for infant baptism. And let us remember that baptism as a sign of God's grace is the mark and sign under which all of us live. Let us join in singing Jesus Loves Me.
Baptism is a sign to us of the mercy and grace of God, indicating that we do not come into relationship with God on the basis of anything that we ourselves do, but simply upon the basis of God's gracious initiative toward us. The baptism of children is a particularly significant manifestation of this sign. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, bring the children unto me, do not forbid them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And I ask you now in the presence of God and these and this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture Philip Andrew in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to lead a Christian life, and to openly profess his faith? Philip Andrew, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, if you'll place your hands on him, please. Philip Andrew, the Holy Spirit work within you that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philip Andrew is the newest member of the household of faith. And we today pledge to do all that we can as representatives of Christ's holy church to nurture him in the Christian faith so that as he grows up in the church, that he'll stand at this or some other altar and profess his own faith in Jesus Christ. And all of this is God's great gift offered freely to us without price. Calvin's Geneva half us in prison. <laughs> Let us join in our response. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Philip Andrew, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life. See 
before he came that first time, gracious God, his people hoped for, for a Messiah with an agenda of power and politics. His own people longed for national restoration, visions of former glories and prestige danced in their heads. And then, O oh God, he came. And in his coming to them as a baby in a borrowed stall was all unexpected and unacceptable to them. And then his becoming a gentle man of peace was confusing and demeaning. He had no political plans. He was simply unmessianic to them. And this Advent season, gracious God, reminds us that he comes still. He comes continually. And now he comes into a world where again babies are too often unwanted and unloved. The Prince of Peace comes to a world at war. Political agendas are still foremost in the minds of too many people. O oh, come, Lord Jesus. Come, O oh, risen Christ. Come in special ways to the bereaved. Come in special ways to the sad, to the unfulfilled, to the unwanted. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, O risen Christ. Come to those in harm's way. And come to those expectant hearts that wait and watch and prepare. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Epistle reading is from Romans, chapter 15, verses 4 through 13. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, in accordance with Christ, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God 
in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord all the Gentiles and let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall come, the one who raises the rule to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. So good to see all of you on this second Sunday of Advent as we gather to worship in this beautiful place and as we celebrate the coming birth of Jesus, the coming of the celebration of Jesus' birth. Advent is a forward-looking season. We look to the future. Therefore, it is a season of hope, a season of hope. This week, I looked up hope in the dictionary, something for some reason I, I guess I had never done before, just to see what the dictionary definition is, and I found it striking. Webster's definition is really quite simple. It is a wish or a desire accompanied by a confidence of the fulfillment of that wish or desire. Confidence. A confident assurance that that wish or desire would be fulfilled. Hope. And the theme for our Advent season this year is, what are we hoping for? What are we hoping for? Sometimes our hopes are based on that which is strong and sturdy, a sound foundation for hope. And sometimes our hope is not based on that which is strong and sound and sturdy. For example, when you think about what we hope for at, during the season of Advent, 
Sometimes what we are hoping for is that perfect Christmas. You know what I mean? That perfect Christmas with the perfect holiday spirit. And when we hope for that, our hopes are disappointed. That sort of perfection of feeling. As though Christmas is a feeling. There's even a song that says that. Christmas is a feeling. But Christmas is much, much more than that. The firm foundation of our hope is what is really at the heart of Christmas. Not a feeling. Not an experience. Not a holiday spirit. But what is at the heart of Christmas is an event. And that is the coming of God into the world in a decisive way in Jesus Christ. And it is that on which our hope is based. Hope, a confident expectation of fulfillment. A confident expectation. Hope is, is a powerful word. And as that definition says, the key to it, or what is at the heart of hope, is a kind of confidence. A confident expectation of the fulfillment of that which we desire. Hope. The Apostle Paul talked about hope a lot. For Paul, hope was one of the big three. Faith, and hope, and love. Those things that endure, that last, that are central to the gospel message. For Paul, we could have in Jesus a firm, confident expectation, hope, that the present circumstance would give way to something new, that the present turmoil would give way to peace, that the present brokenness would give way to wholeness, that the dead end in front of us would give way to a new beginning. To use Paul's words, that the sufferings of this present time would give way to the glory that is to be revealed to us, that death would give way to resurrection and new life. A confident expectation is what Paul was talking about. And so Paul's benediction in the 15th chapter of Romans is, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. You hear how strong the word hope is? I want us to hear it that way in this season of Advent because the way we use the word is usually not so strong. The word hope often has come to mean for us, well, maybe, possibly. Think about that. Hope. Well, I hope, we say, almost with a kind of resignation. It has become for us quite often a weak word. Yesterday evening, Susan and I attended three Sunday school class parties. Party animals we are. <clears throat> Went from one party to the other. But I was thinking about how, you know, when someone in that one of those classes was trying to decide who would be there to order food and to make all the arrangements, and maybe they got on the phone, started calling around, you're going to be at the party. If somebody answered, well, we hope we can get by there, means they're probably not going to be there. Hope has sort of taken on that kind of weak, polite way of saying probably not. Maybe, but not likely. Contrast that with a confident expectation of fulfillment. It's a powerful definition, right out of Webster's. And it fits what the Apostle Paul is saying about hope throughout. Paul knew the challenges of life. He knew the struggles of life. But Paul also knew the power of that confident expectation that he had in Jesus Christ. The God of hope, Paul said. The 
God of hope. Powerful. So what are we hoping for in this season? What are we hoping for? Last week we talked about hoping for peace and we found in the words of Isaiah, just as Paul says we would find in our text for today, words that engender hope. Paul says that our hope is based on memories. It's based on the teachings of days gone by. It's based on what God has done. It's based on memory, really. Kind of collective memory of the people of faith. And so in Isaiah, we find, as we did last week, great images of peace because we're hoping for peace. We find in our text today also great images of peace, of a lion and a, and a, a calf, of a wolf and a lamb together, images of reconciliation and peace. But we have other hopes as well. And as I think about what what we're hoping for and, and what people talk about when they voice their deepest hopes. I'm not talking about a hope for a Christmas feeling or a holiday spirit, but the deepest hopes. Often what people express is a hope for a new beginning, a fresh start. And in our text today, as Isaiah writes to a people very much in need of a new beginning, of a newness of life, he lifts up another image of hope. During Isaiah's time of prophesying, there were four kings. Uzziah, who was a good and faithful king, who sort of got full of himself and proud and, uh, and fell away from faithfulness to God. Followed by Jotham, his son, who sought to be faithful to God and is remembered on balance as a good king followed by, by Ahaz who was a bad king uh, because Ahaz very nervous about trusting God decided to sort of trust all the gods and, and uh, worship all the gods just to sort of you know make sure he covered all the bases that was Ahaz followed by Hezekiah another good king you see there was this back and forth throughout good king bad king good king bad king this kind of instability and that great tree that powerful and mighty tree of a united monarchy ruled over by the greatest of the kings King David the tree of Jesse had been cut off cut down the people Bewildered, anxious, concerned. What does the future hold? The great nation has been cut off like a tree. Where is hope? Is there a chance for a new beginning, a new start, a new life? And Isaiah holds up a powerful image. He says, out of the stump of Jesse will spring up a sprout sprout from the stump of Jesse and out of the root of Jesse will spring up a, a branch it's a powerful image I remember years ago at uh, the church I was serving before I came here First Church Georgetown there was a big tree in the playground and and the preschool was named after that tree called the learning tree beautiful big old tree but it got diseased and and uh, started to rot and, and some of the limbs would fall. Of course, it became dangerous. We couldn't have the children playing under falling limbs. And so the trustees had to make the difficult decision to cut the tree down. And they didn't want to cut it low to the ground so that a child might trip over it or fall and hit his head on it. So they cut it off about five feet above the ground. And I remember the spring following that, there was a shoot coming out of the side of that stump. The stump looked completely dead. But here comes a shoot. And, and by late spring, there were a number of shoots. And by summer, you could hardly see the top of that stump as it had leafed out all around, shoots growing out. 
a powerful image of hope, life, new beginning out of that which seems to be completely dead. Now the Apostle Paul picks up on that image. As Christians did, as they looked back 700 years and they, and they saw that prophecy of a king that would arise, who would rule, rule with justice, wisdom, the one who would give new beginnings, the one who would come as a sprout from that dead stump of Jesse. Paul looks back and says, that is who Jesus is. The one who comes bringing hope. The one who comes showing us that there's always the opportunity for a new start, a new beginning. The one who brings the love and grace of God present with us to give us a chance to begin again, to start over, to receive forgiveness, to have a new chance, a clean slate. The power of starting over of beginning again is what we see in that powerful image. And we see it in Jesus, the Word made flesh, the very presence of God in our midst. Hope, hope for a new beginning. Now this isn't just slushy sentimentality or something like that. It's not just wishful thinking. But it is that confident expectation because of who God is. And we know who God is because we know about who Jesus is. And we see the love and the grace and the forgiveness. The one who said over and over that God loves, God accepts back, God restores. The one who could say, your sins are forgiven. Rise, take up your pallet and walk. The one who could say, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Whatever the path you've been on, there's the opportunity for a new path. Whatever has happened in the past is past. And there is the opportunity for a new beginning at any moment. That is the good news of our faith. The good news that is at, is at the heart of Christmas. I think about a man named Paul. Paul, when he was growing up, was abused as a child. And he grew up, as is usually the case, to be an abuser. He landed in jail even. Uh, after growing up at the hands of abuse, he was angry and that abuse spread as he let it loose on other people. Well, following that time in jail, he learned about Jesus and he became a Christian and he married and he, and he had a little girl. But he was not whole. He was not well. He was still very much a sick man, carrying the burdens of that past right into the present with him and looking ahead and seeing only that in the future. One Christmas, he had scraped together about $8. They, they were struggling as a family and he told his wife to buy food with it and she spent a dollar of it on wrapping paper and tape. Now that tells you how long ago this was. He was furious when she came home with the wrapping paper and tape. What a waste of money. And he just let that anger spill out all over her. And they got into this terrible fight. And while they were fighting, his little daughter found the wrapping paper and the tape and put together a little package. And when he saw it, that old stuff just came up like that. He just snapped and... All that anger came out and he was furious that she would waste that wrapping paper and she would make something so ugly as that. And, and he began to hit the child. For the rest of his life, he could never tell that story without weeping with the memory of it. 
The next morning, Christmas morning, the little child came from around the, the tree with, a, with her package and, and he felt so bad about what he'd done the day before that he took the package and he said, thank you. He opened it and it was empty. And from out of nowhere came this anger again. He didn't strike her this time, but he just told her how stupid that was and, and that you don't give a gift of an empty box. And, and she said, but daddy, it's not empty. I filled it with kisses and love for you. He was devastated. He fell on his knees. He begged her forgiveness and he held on to her and he begged God's forgiveness. And it was at that point that he knew he needed help. It was that turning point where he knew that his life, that he had carried with him all that old stuff, that he had carried it into the present, that it was destroying his life and those around him. And he began to get help. And he began to recover. And he kept that box around just to remind him of that whole story. But beyond that, he kept that box around so that he could take out some of that love and some of those kisses when he began to, to feel the weight of his past. And he was able to continue on that road to recovery a powerful story because it is the story that no matter what the past is, no matter what's going on, there's a chance for a new beginning, a new start, and a new life. That is the good news of Christmas. It's that that is at the heart of the Advent hope, a chance for a new beginning. Whatever you've done, wherever you've been, Whatever is in the past, by God's grace, you can begin anew. That's why the great Christmas stories inspire us so much. You know, like Ebenezer Scrooge, Charles Dickens described Ebenezer Scrooge in, his, in that uh, colorful way. Ebenezer Scrooge as a uh, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint, he said. Flint that had never had steel strike generous fire. That's Ebenezer Scrooge. One he described as secret, self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. Ebenezer Scrooge. But in the magic of that Christmas tale, Ebenezer Scrooge has the opportunity to look back at his past, to see where he's been and, and what has influenced his life and to, to look at all of that. He has the opportunity to look at the present and where he is and where his life is headed. He looks into the future and at first it looks all dark. It looks like just the same stuff with no good ending, but he begins to see the possibilities. And Ebenezer Scrooge becomes a new person. What's so powerful about that is the opportunity for a new beginning. Even that late in life, even with all that he's done, even with how terrible he's been, he has this opportunity to start anew and he feels as energetic as a child on Christmas morning. He's a new person. It's a powerful story told in many forms, in many ways. The old Grinch who tried to steal Christmas, whose heart was two sizes too small, you know, becomes by the end of the story one whose heart has grown three sizes larger. Or George in It's a Wonderful Life who thinks that his life has mattered not at all through the magic of that experience sees the world 
as it would be had he not existed, and he realizes his life has meaning and purpose and it matters. All of those touch our hearts because they're about new beginnings. There are people who have wound in tightly on themselves, have become self-contained and solitary like oysters. They're lonely. They, their hearts have atrophied because of that loneliness and the pain and whatever it is that they bear. And maybe they feel like their lives don't matter. And the good news of our faith is that God has come to us in the most personal way that we might have new life and new beginnings at any moment. And that is good news. I want to close with Paul's benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lying.